Uh, we have Rob Dickinson joining us. Rob is the CTO and co-founder of Resur Resurface Labs. Excuse me. Um, welcome, Rob. Qu pleasure to have you. Oh, and I think we still have Rob on mute. Oh, so, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Great. Uh, we'll let's let's share uh, Rob's screen, and I will exit stage left. The floor is yours, sir. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, so great to be with you here. Um, and our topic for the day is talking about securing PII at runtime, uh, one of my personal favorite topics. And this is an API-centric talk, of course. So we're going to be looking at privacy and compliance at the source, where that data is being created at the API microservices. I am Rob Dickinson, CTO at Resurface Labs, and easy to find online. Love to keep the conversation going. And the agenda that we're going to cover today, um, we're going to look at the challenge of storing PII. We're going to quickly go through some anti-patterns and some strategies. And we'll end with a data architecture that shows how to put some of those strategies into, uh, into practice. And we'll use uh, Resurface as an interesting uh, test case or example of, of showing how to do that. OK, so why is, why is PII so important? Why, why is this such an exciting topic? Um, especially for us at Resurface. Uh, at, at Resurface, we really believe that API monitoring is the key to better APIs, um, not just for quality, but also for security. And we're really desperate to, to help the market break out of this perimeter whack-a-mole kind of mode that, that we've been in to a long time and be able to apply the observability, be able to apply what we know about customers what we know about our activity on our APIs to really build stronger and more resilient systems. That all sounds great, but there's a catch. That really means to do this well, we have to work with PII. We can't really evade those requirements. Um, if we really wanna understand what our customers are doing, we need customer data to go with that. And that's, a key, that's a key component. Now, I know <laughs> the subject of PII comes up it's it's maybe not the uh, the most fun topic, the most exciting topic. It's not like oh, let's get some more performance. Um, you know, some people feel uh, very very triggered by this. Um, oops, painting this off there a little bit. Um, you know, it uh, might might give you a headache. Um, there are still a lot of folks that are operating kind of in a denial based mode about this. Um, let, let's just hope it goes away. Let's hope we don't get caught. Um, let's hope uh, you know, the regulations fail in the courts. Um, for some folks, there's just a sense of existential dread when it comes to this. Um, we know that PII is eventually going to leak. We know it's eventually going to have bad stuff associated with it. Um, so this is tough. It's, it's an emotionally charged topic, obviously. There's a lot of risk involved. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to push through this and we're going to we're going to try to get to some actual real strategies um, that will take you kind of out of this emotional timbre and, and in a more uh, productive headspace. The stakes are really high, as we know. Um, we're not doing a really great job <laughs> keeping this PII out of the hands of attackers um, as an industry. So when you look at the numbers, about half of the breaches come from malicious attacks. About half of the breaches come from just honest mistakes, system human failures, um, configuration errors, that kinds of thing. But a lot of these breaches, the vast majority of breaches do include customer PII. And that's really bad because that's really expensive. These breaches take a long time, um, or they're, the, the attacks are actually running for a long time, and they do a lot of damage. This is really one of the classic blunders in terms of uh, releasing a web-based service today um, is, is having this kind of breach of your, of your PII. So regardless of how we feel about PII, regardless of how we feel about GDPR, CCPA, these other regulations, the writing's on the wall. Um, we can obviously see that to do this wrong and to not pay attention to how we're securing our PII is really going to get very expensive. Um, even in the short term. So this is a this is a topic that's really worth uh, pay, paying attention to. At the same time, this is not an easy domain. This is not an easy topic to get into. There are a ton of challenges that make this hard. And that's why it gives us a headache. 
That's why maybe we just want to think about something else. And just quickly, we'll go through um, some of these. I'm sure some of these will not be a surprise um, at all. Um, obviously, tightening regulatory environment, things like GDPR that are driving the, the, the need for this and, and putting a real price on privacy and security. And that's great. Um, I mean, yes, it's tightening regulations, but those tightening regulations actually give the technologists cover to do what needs to be done to, to solve these problems. So it's a challenge, but it's also a fundamentally good thing. Um, of course, the stuff is changing very, very quickly. Um, another challenge in this is even the definitions of what is PII and what do we consider PII is gradually expanding over time. Um, this is not a static environment um, by, by any measure. There's lots of vendors, lots of platforms where that PII might be stored. All those vendors and platforms work differently, um, yet we have common needs to be able to secure this information. We want to establish common policies. For example, that's very difficult to do in a, in a multi-vendor landscape. This is another tough one. In a lot of cases, especially when we're using third-party products, we don't have the ability to change those apps or change those databases to make them more secure um, or to manage their secu security more specifically to our environments. That's a huge change. Um, even if you do own the app, um, it might be hard to, to get those changes made. But if you don't own the app, it's, it's an order of magnitude more difficult. Another factor is there's many, many different techniques for security and privacy. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to encrypt, to detokenize, to de-identify. Um, when do you pick the right technique for the right environment, for the right kind of data? Um, it's that, that in itself is not easy. Um, as you can see, there's a repeating theme here. There's no real easy button for this. It's not like you can just go out on the market and say, let's, let's buy the thing that gives us secure PII and we'll, we'll adopt that in 10 minutes and be done. Um, that makes the compliance high still. Um, and some folks are doing the math on this and saying, you know what, even if we have a PII leak and we get fined, well, that the amount of that fine was probably, you know, the amount of time it would have taken for our uh, time and effort it would have taken for our development team to, to fix, which is a terrible outcome. Um, so as an industry, we really need solutions that are driving down the, the cost of the compliance here. There's also these ideas that are floating around, security by default, privacy by default. These are new concepts. A lot of systems don't implement those concepts yet. We're even still trying to figure out what those concepts really mean. Um, and that's another source of, of drift. We have cases where we need to legitimately share data. That, that puts a different spin on, on security here. We also need to implement new requirements like revocation. Um, when a user revokes their consent, we need to, to destroy that data or remove the ability to access that data. Of course, we've got things like zero day failures and attacks. And at the end of all this, of course, to make any changes, we're gonna have to get our developers' attention to, uh, to, to help them uh, or, or have them help us in make these systems more resilient and more secure. So, wow, I mean, that's a, a huge list of challenges to try to get through. So how do you, how do you possibly uh, navigate all this? So to help, you, to help you move forward on this, um, the next thing that we'll do is we'll talk about some of the anti-patterns. So now that you see what the challenges are, what are kind of some of the knee-jerk reactions that might actually make things worse? And then we'll look at a positive example of how you can use a, a virtualized data architecture to address a lot, not all, um, but a lot of the, the concerns that we're raising here on the slide. All right, so knee-jerk reaction time. <laughs> Sometimes those knee-jerk reactions might make things worse. So let's talk just quickly about what some of those anti-patterns look like. Um, some of these are fun. Um, I personally love the no PII here strategy, which is basically like we're going to pretend that we actually don't have any PII. Now, granted, there are domains where the amount of PII is limited. 
but I would hazard <laughs> the the statement that ultimately there is. I mean, every every project, every company, every organization ultimately exists to serve a, a customer base, and there's going to be PII, especially because the definition of what PII is is actually constantly expanding. But you still do run into people that kind of say, well, we don't really have to worry about PII because we don't have any. And when you really start to push on that, you find out that that they do. Um, kind of the flip side of that is uh, the, the like the manager that I worked for years ago that said, we're just going to treat everything like it's PII. We're going to treat every piece of information like it's a credit card number. And that sounds great, but it's, it's a shortcut to thinking. Um, as it turns out, it's it's not a one size fits all kind of solution or environment, so that that's kind of dangerous. Um, the other way we can tackle this or kind of you know really really uh, sabotage ourselves is we'll create what I call an an impossible approval process. You know, there there's a there's a way that will give you permission to gather PII, but it has to go all the way up to the CEO of the company, and and all these other people have to sign off on it, and it's and it's practically impossible to to get it done. Um, another really classic anti-pattern is you have certain administrators that really are, are God mode. They can access whatever they want. Um, failing to get user consent, undisclosed par third-party transfers. Of course, these are aspects of legislation like GDPR and CCPA. On the technical side, some classic anti-patterns. Let's create one giant database that's a honeypot that all of our attackers will be drawn to. Terrible idea, taking all of your PII and putting it in one place. Overly destructive transforms. Let's just let's just destroy the PII so it can't harm us. One-time masking. We'll just mask it at, at content at, at the at the right time at the capture time. Pretending that perimeter security will be enough. Just encrypting everything, and really relying on production-only configurations that you can't reproduce easily in pre-production. These are all ways that you might think of to kind of address some of these fundamental issues around PII or just cope with the emotional side of that. But none of these actually puts you on a very good path for, for PII protection. All right, so in terms of what are we going to do then? What are the positive uh, strategies that we can cling to and apply? They're very, very simple. And a lot of this just comes from kind of classical security thinking but applied to the, the modern API ecosystem. So even this year, even with all of our modern systems that we have, people are still the weakest link. People make mistake. People make mistakes, just like I did. People can be exploited. Um, people have weaknesses that systems don't. So people are always the, the weakest link. So what you're going to do then in terms of thinking about managing your PII is you want to optimize for the number of conspirators or the number of people that have to mess up, either intentionally or unintentionally, to actually create the conditions for that breach. Again, that's why you don't want like a God mode administrator. If that's one person um, that can be a conspirator that, that, can, that can open up access to all your data, that's, that's a terrible, terrible outcome. Um, when you look at how many people can participate in a secret, it really breaks down about three or four. It's, it's almost impossible to, to keep a secret beyond a, a, a relatively small number of people. So that's okay. We can, we can actually optimize for that. What we're going to do then is for each of our people in, in the chain and for all the people that have access to this information, we want to enforce the narrowest possible set of permissions. Very, very consistent, um, very consistently. And that means we need to read it, regularly audit those permissions. Those permissions were, will change over time as people move into new roles, as new kinds of data is available, as new kinds of projects are created. So we constantly need to be revisiting and asking this question of who in the organization really needs access to that data? What, what do they really need to do with it and, and how often? So that's kind of on the, on the people side. On the tech side, Again, we want to think about siloing this data, um, breaking this data into multiple pieces, and not having all of our data in one place and creating that giant honeypot database. And as it turns out, APIs and microservices are great for de-siloing this data. 
Um, it's a really, you know, it's, it's adding complexity, it's adding granularity, but, but we're, we're creating more silos for that data to live in, and we're making it harder to compromise every silo at the same time to get all of the data back out. So we want to optimize for the number of silos that have to be breached. The more silos that you have to breach, the greater the chances are that you'll get caught. Then just for some quick tactical things, we want to keep that data close to the source. Um, you know, transferring that data to third parties is getting harder and harder every year. Um, that's one of the classic things. So keep that data close in the jurisdiction, preferably where the API lives. Expire data automatically. Don't rely on humans to have to do this, but build in, build in policies where data automatically rolls off. Monitoring your PII transfer. There are systems like Resurface that will help you do this, but knowing where that PII is going and where it's flowing and in what cases is a hugely important um, aspect of this, of really having that observability. And then one of the real uh, rock star ways of dealing with this that we'll show you in, in a little bit more detail, um, the next slide here, is virtualizing access to that master data through a query layer, through a control layer, that allows you to control the shaping of that data. And that's really the kinds of thinking that we want to ultimately be ascribing to here. So what do we mean by that? Um, Trito is actually a good, uh, very, very good platform for doing this. And this is what we're doing with Resurface, is we're using this combination of Trino and Resurface um, to deliver uh, an API monitoring system that is actually able to capture all of the data and then also able to provide these security protections and privacy protections in a very, very fluid manner. So Trino is the new name for post uh, for Presto SQL. So you might not know it under that name still. Originally came out of Facebook. And the idea behind Trino is you can do queries in SQL to any number of, of data sets that are federated out there on the network. And Resurface is really unique. We built a storage engine working backwards from, from Trino um, to provide an API system of record that really can participate with all these other kinds of data sources. What that means for securing PII now is at the Trino layer, at, in, that, in that virtual data access layer, I can use views. And those views can do things like select what columns a user can see, select what rows a user can see, then also do all these kinds of different transformations, do my tokenizing, my map, my, my masking, sampling, map reduce, creating summaries, hiding details. We can control those through user and group level grants. Um, the, the SQL database model and SQL security model in general, um, although it's you know, time proven and not, not brand new and sexy, but it actually handles these kinds of cases extremely well. Um, the, the view capability in, in SQL, and especially as implemented by tools like, like Trino and Resurface, give you just an amazing capability to layer on these security and privacy protections. So for example, views can inherit from other views. Um, you, can, you can create composable, structures, basically reusable structures fairly easily through this. Um, your views also apply retroactively. So this gives us the ability to move forward and, and backwards in time. And, and that's hugely important. And the last thing here um, is we can do all of this without needing to change our existing databases or our existing applications at all. Um, to use a, a virtual data access layer like like what we're doing with with Trino and Resurface. Uh, now, in our case, we actually built a storage engine um, specifically for that kind of data. But in terms of of mapping this idea into your into your organization, um, you don't have to do that. Um, Trino is really built to work with with existing databases without expecting those to be changed. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on here is monitoring that use of your PII and especially monitoring leaks. So we need, one of the things that we need is we need better ways to detect those breaches. Resurface is a really interesting example of doing that because we're really trying to guide our users directly to 
when when those cases are happening. And this is our, our upcoming V3 release. And our, our new UI in V3 is Slack and Teams. Um, we want to guide users towards these kinds of issues um, instead of just showing dashboards and expecting uh, customers to, to, to figure it out for themselves. Um, I think this is really exciting security and, and opening up new uses of PII. It's, it's really going to take us from this place where we, we might feel some dread around these topics to where we really can work with this data creatively. We really can unlock a lot of insights about what our customers are actually doing. And uh, hopefully this talk uh, gave you some, some ideas to, to help you on that journey. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, you just hit the, uh, the 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 question I was gonna um, uh, first ask at the at the very end, talking about t tokenization. Um, and so, we, obviously, there is no way to to eliminate PII, of course, uh, in really in any scenario. But to to what degree do you see tokenization as is that a, is it a viable mitigant for the quantity of of data that we're 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 hosting uh, that's sensitive? I, I think we can all see that we're hitting the limits of static tokenization and and you know symmetric tokenization i mean that i think that's what people would would meet you know most people immediately think of um but i think there's there's a lot of really really good work being done around dynamic um de-identification and again that and, and another i think anti-pattern there is is if you're only thinking about that at capture time um you're you only have one chance to get it right but if you if you virtualize that those concepts, then you can go back and adjust those access rights or adjust that masking or adjust that tokenization level or tune it for a particular audience. And so I think, yeah, as, as we're moving from more of the static techniques to more of the dynamic techniques, mm -hmm. it's the same idea. Right. I mean, tokenization has been around forever, mm -hmm. but but to apply that in a much more dynamic way, I, I think, is is really exciting. So can you talk us through, um, I guess, a, 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 like a, a customer engagement, for example, when, when, they, when, when you see it, have, have this idea presented, uh, you're sharing Trino for the first time, what are the first steps you take? What are the objections? Uh, and and how, do you, uh, how do you coach people through uh, the process of sort of getting comfortable with this new approach? Yeah, it's, um, you know, ultimately, ultimately the thing that we're solving for is how do we get our development teams to care more about these issues and care more, meaning spend more time and more energy. I mean, almost every security person that we talk to says this in some way, you know, I, I wish I could get my development team to stop creating so many problems for me. Um, I think the biggest thing in that is really to meet those developers where they live. Um, it's, it's giving them this information in a way that's very actionable. Um, it's really guiding, um, towards towards those outcomes, um, and 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 really having a light touch as far as as far as what changes are are needed to those systems to actually be able to to adopt some of these new ideas, and that's why I mean I just I love things like Trino, um, you know, as as compared to like a message queue, you know, if you put in a message queue, that always means you're rewiring how your data is flowing around your network and so many databases and so many data access systems require you to put your data into those systems before you can really get any value out. And what I love about systems like Trino and, and those kinds of query first architectures is you really just let the data live where it already lives mm -hmm. and you, you join the data over, over the network and then you can provide those those virtualized and user group level based uh, roles on top of it. Um, but you're not having to go back and say, hey, let's let's you know, let's adopt a new SDK that helps us do this. Or we'll have to use this special database and we'll have to somehow magically migrate. Um, it's, it's very easy in privacy and compliance, I think, to have really, really good ideas and, and high standards of what you'd like to accomplish but really, really struggle with how to how to implement those ideas in your systems. Well, um, Rob, we uh, we could probably spend a lot more time on this, but we are we are at time. So how can people uh, reach out to you to continue the discussion? Um, do are we have a um, 
over in the partner stage today. Um, was there a, a, a slide that we could show that has Rob's contact information? There we go. Perfect. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm easy to find and would love to love to keep the conversation going. And I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be around uh, attending some of the other uh, talks at the event. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Rob. Have a great day. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.